It came from outer space to fill the world with terror. What earthly power can stop this terror? That's the signpost up ahead. Your next stop. The Bloodhounds. From outer space. Oktoberfest. Right before we record this eloquent podcast. Starting off October right, getting a little creepy with it. And it's a podcast from outer space, boys. It's your boy, Rob Scott. We got Adam Narlock in the house. Hey, guys. Thanks for listening. And as always, Ryan Scott. Hello, hello, everybody. And, you know, once again, brought to you by Pamp Coffee. You know, it's local, San Diego. Uh, Go ahead and check them out. Etsy.com slash shop slash Pamp Coffee. And, you know, they just added a couple new flavors. We should be getting that in this week. That's actually why we're doing this ad for them right now. And, you know, I'm not going to make you wait anymore. We're getting right into it. We're getting creepy. We're getting spooky. We're talking about the monster. We're talking about Frankenstein and Mary Shelley. Yes, everybody. It is finally, we are in the thick of October. Um, Thick with two Cs. (laughs) First night we've been able to record in here with no fan. Ooh, yeah. Not hot. Adam's wearing a sweat jacket. Your man's not hot. Yeah, he's also wearing a purple bandana, so... Just get that visual in your head real quick, guys. It's the Tupac look. Now, in the vein of Halloween, we are discussing the life of Mary Shelley, the ultimate goth, uh, from her early childhood to her writing of the world-renowned Frankenstein and all the fuckery in between. Now, we'll also get into the many renditions of the tale over the years, but we will mostly be discussing Shelley's life and influences. Now, some say she was the Jessica Rabbit of her day. Jessica Rabbit? You know who framed Roger Rabbit? <laughs> uh, I don't know if that, I would say that. Yeah, you seen the pictures, buddy? Hey. Whoa, come on. The paintings. Come on. She's <laughs> not that bad. I mean, she's not Jessica Rabbit, but... Well... Rob's into that kind of thing. Not the Jessica Rabbit of her day. Don't know where you heard that. I think this guy just maybe thinks that she has red hair. He has a thing for redheads, as we all know. I don't know. think she does, buddy. <laughs> now, Frankenstein is often cited as the birth of science fiction and remains to this day one of the most recognizable icons in the horror genre. Now, what do you guys... uh remember about Frankenstein as young lads coming up in this world? I think my first exposure to the idea of Frankenstein, you guys remember that show Wishbone about the dog? I mean, who doesn't? Shiloh? No. That's a different dog. Oh, okay. Wishbone, he solved like mysteries? He's looking like the tar. Yeah, yeah. What's the story, Wishbone? Did that have uh, Frankie Muniz? Oh my no, God, I think that dude. was... You're thinking of that movie. My Dog Spot. My Dog yeah. Skip. Oh, Skip. Skip. Yeah, Skip. You should know, dude. You cried in the movie. We all did. We all did. Don't don't act like you were tough. I don't think I did. Let's go watch it right now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we're stopping the podcast to go watch My Dog Skip, you guys. guys. You guys should go ahead and do the same. All right, so Shiloh. Wishbone. Wishbone. The target dog. Okay. Yeah. He's got the thing on his eye? Yeah. Like the bullseye. Yeah. So what? He solved a Frankenstein case. I don't think. He, I don't think he solved cases. <laughs> I don't think I, he's a detective. <laughs> I. I feel like he kind of just like, they like adventures they go on. Yeah, they like retold the story in like a kid friendly version. Oh, like Frank and Weenie. Yeah, but way before that. Okay. All right, Rob. Oh, man, I think that uh, the first thing I remember is seeing the old black and white way back in the day. Black and white? You talking like Universal? I would assume so. Well, what happens when That's we like assume things on this podcast? Oh, come on. <laughs> Please. So you just remember seeing the movie? I just remember seeing the black and white movie, you know? And I was like, why is everyone so scared of this guy? He's actually a pretty nice guy. <laughs> That's what your initial thought was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, honestly, he killed a little girl. He didn't um, know any better. Uh, yeah, he's, he's a, like Lenny. Basically, he has retard strength. I, you know, I was actually Spectrum doing this strength. research, and um, no, 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 we don't use re- retard. That's oh, spectrum. come on, spectrum. please. Not politically on correct. The Neither is now. <laughs> <laughs> so I Two was doing this research. Things. I'm thinking Frankenstein is like the classic trope. He's the Iron Giant. Mm. He is Lenny from Mice and Men. 
you know? Well, he's actually before both of those, so... Exactly. But, you know, that's the common thread we see again and again. Well, also, you just take a look at how fucked up Mary Shelley's life was, and then you can realize why she wrote the damn thing. Well, yep. Now, we'll one of my... We'll that later in the podcast, though. Now, one of my very early memories was uh, making a movie. As always, you know, we <laughs> had a VHS video recorder. We used to make little films. I remember making Frankenstein, and uh, Rob was playing the scientist, and he would, like... So do Frankenstein. The, yeah, he would do the classic, like, it's alive, it's alive. And uh, <laughs> I just could not stop laughing. <laughs> he got so pissed off at me. But, you know, we did Dracula. You're trying to make a serious film, all right? <laughs> oh, I know, man. Those Some of those films were very um, groundbreaking for their time. Now, we did all the Universal Monsters, so... As well as Titanic. <laughs> yeah, going off that, what is your guy's favorite Universal Monster? If I had to pick one, I'm going with the Invisible Man. Is that a monster? You know, I think so. I think the main ones are like Frank. It's not a monster. It's a man. Frankenstein. He's invisible. Wolfman. He wears sunglasses. The Mummy, Phantom of the Opera, and Creech from the Black Lagoon. What about the Hunchback? Is that that's just, oh, yep. is and that then a man? Though, I mean, or is that a Hunchback and um, and Invisible Man are also thrown in there. Those were very early Universal films, you know. But are they monsters? Are any of these guys actually monsters? Well, that's the... the creature from the Black Lagoon is definitely right. a monster. Now, what defines a monster? Right? We're not arguing You're the legitimacy monster. of the monsters We're here. We're just semantics. picking our favorites. I'm just saying. I think Rob is a monster. Uh, well, some people may say that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sticking with the Invisible Man. I'm going to go with Creature from the Black Lagoon, the only actual monster on the damn list. Man, I'm going with that too, I think. You know, that was a tough one for me. It was between the mummy, mm. Wolfman, and Creature from the Black okay, Lagoon. Okay, let's be honest though. The mummy and Wolfman, not really that scary. It's not a matter of scary. It's Dude. a matter of are they yeah. a monster? When it's I was a kid, man, monsters, oh, buddy. mummy, please. very scary. Wolfman, not scary. The mummy? Are we ass. talking like Brendan Fraser <laughs> mummy? Well, even the Boris Karloff mummy, dude. Just the cover of it freaked me out. <laughs> it was I. Right. It was I. Right. Now, Creature from the Black Lagoon, only reason I'm picking that one is because I remember dad showing me the film, telling me the tale, and I was so young that I literally didn't know what a movie was, so I thought it was real. We thought some creature was going to come out of that <laughs> yeah. lake in our neighborhood. I, dude, I honestly did. I was terrified. Right on the there. street behind our house. Now does, meet you. does this bear any semblance to the teacher from the Black Lagoon? What's that? A book about a teacher from the Black Lagoon. You guys ain't never yeah, heard that? I have. In school? Apparently this guy didn't go to school very much. <laughs> never heard of that. Was the teacher from the Black Lagoon like an, an Encyclopedia Brown book or something? Oh, my gosh. Why does everything have to be a damn detective story with you? (laughs) What kind of stuff have you been up to lately? I've been getting to the bottom of these cases. (laughs) And this guy didn't even read. This guy's over here eating Scooby snacks, trying to get to the bottom of cases. All right. Scooby-Doo, it was a mystery. All right. So before we get to the woman herself, we got to cite some sources. Oh, boy. Um, Pulled a lot of the research from nationalgeographic.pl. That's for uh, Polska. Did you know that, Adam? I did. That's my people. Now, also, Google Books got a site, Violence in Early Modern Europe by Julius Ruff, and a Early Germany History book by Margaret Lewis. Were there any detectives in that particular reading? Now, yes, there were, and we're going to get to that a little bit later in the podcast. As always. Now... (laughs) In keeping with the theme about school here, you know, um, I assume it's safe to say that a lot of people out there, uh, maybe some of our listeners, probably studied Frankenstein at school. They might. Right? I mean, teabag, they still teaching this stuff at all? Actually, yeah. Uh, last year, I observed an eighth grade class, and they were reading the graphic novel version, which I thought was pretty cool. Really detailed. I think the pictures help, you know, clarify some of the... Macabre details, if you will. Okay, okay. Now, I definitely did study the Mary Shelley novel in a literature class in college. Same, same. But, you know, this was more focused on the themes of the novel as opposed to Shelley's life. Um, And, you know, you learn the basics. Uh, She wrote the novel. It was groundbreaking success. She was in her late teens. Um, The rest is history. But... 
We're going to find out, guys, that uh, her life and story surrounding the writing of this novel, probably more interesting than the novel itself, I'd say. Mm. And just in time for Halloween, guys, this one's going to get pretty dark. Mm. Rob, hit the lights. Well, let's get into it. So let's hop across the pond way back to 18th century Europe. Way back to jolly old. Um, George III is king. Napoleon's um, just ending his antics, um, his shenanigans. Um, The French Revolution, you know, that's winding down. Uh, Beethoven, just getting his career off the ground. Finally dropped that mixtape. Yep. And (laughs) in Summerstown, London, 1797, (laughs) Mary Wollstonecraft Godwin was born. Hell of a name, honestly. Yep, she was the second child of feminist philosopher and writer Mary Wollstonecraft. Now, Ugh. so that's a maiden name. Because I was going to say, that's a hell of a middle name. Oh, what's her middle name going to be? Oh, it's going to be Wollstonecraft. Now, there's a lot of Marys, uh, a lot of similar names in here, as we'll see. So uh, right now, I'm going to straighten this out. From now on, when you hear Mary, um, just the first name Mary, we're talking about Mary Shelley. <laughs> The Mary Shelley. She was the second child of feminist philosopher and writer Mary Wollstonecraft and first first. child of philosopher, novelist, and journalist William Godwin. Got it, got it, got it, got it, got it. Now, she's born. Mom died 10 days after. Already dark. Of spetisemia, which is like a blood poisoning, a blood um, disease or something like that. And she was raised along with her half-sister Fanny Emley... (laughs) who her mom had from a previous marriage, by old William himself. Um, So basically this guy, he was constantly trying to make ends meet. Uh, He's thinking, there's no way I can do this on my own. Um, He remarries in 1801 to Mary Jane Claremont, keeping with the Mary theme. She already had two daughters of her own that she brings into the picture, most notably Claire Claremont. Well, that's probably a mistake. Yeah, guy already can't make ends meet. <laughs> I'm just Mary. bringing in two more kids. <laughs> two right? more women, yeah, dude. Now, Mary, no secret, Mary Shelley, she hated her stepmom. Got the and, whole um, Cinderella thing going on. Yeah, it's often assumed from uh, various journals and letters, which is where a lot of this stuff comes from, that the old stepmom had uh, favored her own children over those of the late Mary Wollstonecrafts. That's always how it's going to be, fam. Yep, especially back then. Now, the Godwins, they're palling it up. Um, They're basically the Brady Bunch at this point. Uh, (laughs) They start a publishing firm called MJ Godwin. Uh, This firm sold children's books, um, stationary maps, and games, but the business was not profitable. Yeah, they're selling maps and games. <laughs> <laughs> right at the end of the French Revolution. <laughs> hey, now, come get your maps and games. <laughs> now, uh, so Godwin was forced to borrow substantially to keep the business going, um, and he continued to borrow and borrow uh, to pay off early loans, which just added to his problems. Sound familiar to anybody in this room? Sure doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, although Mary had little formal education... Her father, O. Will, uh, tutored her in a broad range of subjects, and he often took all of the children on educational outings, field trips, if you will. I wonder if he was struggling. And uh, they always <laughs> had... a map store taking kids on field trips all the time. They always had access to his library, and he was frequently hacking it up with his intellectual pals, including romantic poet Samuel Taylor Coolridge who uh, you may have also studied in college, and former vice president of the United States, Aaron Burr. That guy was a pure savage. Aaron Burr shot me. (laughs) Yes, that is the same guy who shot his political rival, Alexander Hamilton, in the famous duel of 1804. Too bad they don't still do that today. Now, I mean, first off, can you imagine that? Yeah, it would be awesome. Gunfight at the OK Corral today just... Presidential opponents face off. Everybody slapping. Whoever each other wins in the is face. the president. <laughs> Badass dude. I would run for that shit. So it's no secret that Mary received an unusual but nonetheless advanced education, especially for a lady at the time. 
Oh, I've seen this movie. Uh, now, in June 1812, Mary's father sent her to stay with the family of the radical William Baxter up in Dundee, Scotland. Lads. That's not a knife. And this ended up being a pretty important place in her upbringing as she writes in the 1831 introduction to Frankenstein. I wrote then, but in a commonplace style. It was beneath the trees of the grounds belonging to our house or on the bleak sides of the woodless mountains. In my true compositions, the airy flights in my imagination were born and fostered. <laughs> <laughs> By the time she returned home on the uh, 30th of March, 1814, Percy Shelley enters the picture. Who the hell is this? Now, this guy is a big piece of shit. Husband, this is how she became Mary Shelley. This is Percy Shelley. When did we talk about him? He just showed up? He, well, he's so she, remember, she went to go. Um, she lived with She chill, lived with uh, Scotland. Well. And he, she would kind of go away for the summers, I guess. Like, her dad wanted her to have, like, a broad range of upbringing. So she would go up there, live with this guy for the summers. And Ugh. she's coming home uh, one summer. And this guy, Percy Shelley, he had become estranged from his wife. Uh, and he was regularly visiting Mr. Godwin, Shelley's, or um, Mary's dad. And he, this guy, Percy, had agreed to bail... Mr. God went out of debt at one point. Okay, okay. So, you know, it's no secret he's around the fam a lot at this Throwing point. around money, banging whores. Yep. And, uh. Um, Figures dad owes him one. Yeah, so. All right, all right. You know, Mary and Percy, they begin meeting each other secretly at the grave of Mary Wollstonecraft. Oh. So it just started off dark. In St. Pancras uh, Churchyard. Now. Mary would often spend her time here um, because, as we said, her mom died uh, 10 days after she was born. So she would constantly, like, sit at her mom's grave, spend a lot of afternoons there. Um, she apparently learned to spell her name by tracing the words on her mother's headstone because she was also named Mary. However, this is when Percy Shelley and Mary Godwin fell in love. She was about 16 and he was 22. Now, this reminds me of another romance we've talked about before on this podcast. And what's that? Though he's just nine and she's 14. Yeah, he's probably going to marry her someday. Anakin and Padme. You got it, buddy. Okay, well, um, now. Can I just ask you guys a question? Okay. Shoot. What is the weirdest shit you've ever done in a graveyard? These guys are out here doing God knows what, falling in love, tracing names, learning how to write names. Well, we'll get into that. I don't think I've ever done anything weird. I mean, drank a couple 40s. Okay, well, that's what I was getting I at. mean, classic kid shit, you know, drinking beers, um, trying to summon the devil, <laughs> uh, play with a Ouija board, you know. Oh. Yeah, but see, we used to live down the street from this old Confederate graveyard when I lived in Fredericksburg. All my roommates thought it was weird to do that until we all went out there one night. Everyone started getting creeped out, drank a couple 40s, have some fun, you know. I just remember when I was at the old university, they had all the nuns buried out back, and we would go there and drink beers and smoke cigars. What kind of s some of those uh, special cigarettes? <laughs> cigars. Cigars. Say. Yeah, what, what were they filled with? Uh, you gutted them, and then you put something else inside, maybe? No. <laughs> hey, man, it's California. You don't have to lie about it. This was in Pittsburgh. I know, but I'm saying we're in California now. All right, anywho. Anywho. So a little in, bit of that Mary Shelley. In June of 1814, <laughs> Percy Frank and Mary and declared their love for one another. As Percy announced, he could not hide his ardent passion. And Mary lost her virginity oh. to Percy right atop oh. her mother's grave, describing it as a sublime and rapturous moment. Oh. Now, that's as goth as it gets. I mean, can you really top that? No. Someone can. <laughs> oh, yeah. There's probably a video out there somewhere. Oh, dude, on your own mom's grave? Now, um... Have some respect. Hey, man, his ardent passion was just popping out. <laughs> if you can get it up in that weather. So that was in June of 1814. Uh, by July 1814, the couple eloped and secretly left for France, taking Mary's stepsister, Claire Claremont, with them. 
He's hiding in France, and it took the likes of me to tell you. Now, they leave Percy's pregnant wife behind. Because remember, this guy well, I was thought he previously was divorced. married. No, he was estranged. Estranged. Not divorced. Uh, hey, we've all been there. Um, so she's pregnant. They say He says, fuck it. I'm eloping with Mary, leaving her ass behind. Trio traveled to Paris. Classic dirtbag move. Yo. Well, got this one pregnant. Got to find a new one and peace Finds out. two of them. Yeah, two 16-year-olds. Oh, Now, God. the trio traveled to Paris um, and then by donkey, mule, carriage, and foot through France, which, mind you, had recently been ravaged by war, to Switzerland. Now, that to me uh, is just fucking crazy. And also, I'm thinking, what the hell did people do <laughs> for jobs back then? Well, this guy ran a fucking map store for one, <laughs> no, so no, no, I don't no, think that jobs are as important as they are today. Yeah, that right. Like because the wage gap was so big back then. Like you were either like rich and you could just you know I travel to France, yeah. open a map store, sell <laughs> games, or you were just dirt poor living in in a fucking shanty town or something. Or you're just knocking chicks up left and right and dipping out and going to France. <laughs> so they make Find it a couple sixteen year olds head off. So they make it all the way to Lucerne, um, but due to lack of money. Where the hell is that? Uh, well, that's in what is now Switzerland, but I didn't really look up an old map to see. You could have well, bought, bought one from one your dad. I'm that. guessing it was still uh, <laughs> part of France. But due to lack of money, they're forced to turn back. That doesn't make sense. You get all the way there and then you turn back. <laughs> yeah, I guess. I mean, hell, maybe it was expensive back then. Cost of living, man. Now, Wait either there. before, during, or during the journey, Mary had become pregnant. Ugh. So she and Percy were now flat broke, and her father refused to have anything to do with her. Smart he basically man. disowned her by this point. Uh, now, pregnant and often ill, Mary had to deal with one, Harriet Shelley, Percy's wife, who they left behind, she gave birth to his son in late 1814, and he was stoked on this. Um, and two, he was constantly going out with Claire Claremont on these little outings. This is her stepsister? Yeah, probably banging yeah. her out in the graveyard. It is speculated <laughs> that he was almost certainly having an affair. We know this guy's a fucking dirty freak. <laughs> so this oh, guy's God. got a pregnant wife who he abandoned. Then he comes back. Oh, JK, love my son. And he's banging, he's got Shelly knocked up. Mary Shelly's knocked up. And then he's banging her stepsister. This guy is why condoms were invented. <laughs> now, Mary was partly comforted by the visits of Percy's pal, Thomas Jefferson Hogg. Now, what do you think that guy was packing? You think that was just a clever name? Well, he was storing more than corn in that silo. <laughs> um, now, Shelley didn't like this guy at first. They um, never do. But came to consider him a close friend, and it is speculated that Percy wanted Mary and Hogg to become lovers. <laughs> this dude. <laughs> this guy's banging her stepsister. He's married and has a son and is trying to pawn Mary off on his boy. <laughs> the hog, they call him. Named after t old TJ. <laughs> Swinging dick hog. And we all know that guy was doing the dirty, dirty deeds, too. Oh, yeah. Sally Hemings. <sighs> um, now, Mary did not dismiss the idea since she believed in the idea of free love, quote unquote, in theory. In practice, however, she loved only Percy Shelley and seems to have ventured no further than flirting with Hog. Flirting with a hog. Never a good idea. <laughs> big log hog. It's too big for it. Probably scared her. Now. We've all been there. Well, TJ Hog. February 22nd, 1815. She gives birth to a two-month premature baby girl who was not expected to survive and died two weeks later. The baby. Yes. Now, Percy didn't care about the condition of the child at all, and he left on one of these quote-unquote trips with Claire, <laughs> Mary's stepsister. Um, the loss of this child uh, induced depression in Mary, um, and she was haunted by visions of the baby, of the dead baby. Oh. And on the 24th of January, 1816, so about a year later, Mary gave birth to a second child, William, named after her father. Now, now they should have named that baby Hog. 
Now, William's alive uh, when she writes the novel, but this guy also passed away a few years later of malaria. Hmm. This little guy? Yeah. Little William? Little William. Now, also around the time she was writing Frankenstein, her sister, Fanny Emley, committed suicide by ODing on opiates at the age of 22. Jesus Christ. And Percy's wife, Harriet, the pregnant lady they left behind, she drowned herself in a lake... Uh, in Hyde Park the same year. Now, where was that? That's in, in Scotland? London. 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 So Mary was no stranger to death, which makes Frankenstein that much more creepy. Uh, you know, I mean, she's got both of her first kids dying. Um, her sister, this lady who had her husband's son, you know, it's all around her. She's And she's constantly having to deal with this. And this guy's out banging whores the whole time. And she's going to her mom's grave since she was a very young child. So, you know, death has been in her life uh, from the beginning, you could say. Which is ironic. Now, in May of 1816, Mary Godwin, Percy Shelley, and their son, and Claire Claremont. Don't you think that's a little weird by that point that you're going everywhere with this bitch? (laughs) (laughs) Who's bitch? Claire Claremont. Well, yeah, I mean, Sounds she like had a bitch. That's what I'm saying. She had to deal with this stuff. She knew it was happening. So why did she just be like, "Hey, fuck you"? She's not coming. Hey, you know, different times, man. Different times. Hose be hoes. So they travel to Geneva, Switzerland, and they plan to spend the summer with the poet Lord Byron. Now, that was a savage. Yeah, <laughs> this guy, we I was doing the research, and we could probably do an entire episode on this guy. Um, he was this famous poet, um, loved banging whores, loved banging guys, um, <laughs> got in massive amounts of debt. He had like gonorrhea and syphilis by the age of uh, 20 from banging so many whores. You know, that's um, no surprise. And this guy was also mega famous. He was like Elvis level famous at his time in Europe. And so this guy is almost like if you have Elvis level fame, Meets Charlie Sheen. <laughs> I mean, who's to say Elvis wasn't doing the same kind of stuff? Now, this guy, I mean, probably, but it wasn't publicized. Now, this guy. No one wants to know that Elvis times. had gonorrhea, guys, all right? Now, this guy, Lord Byron, um, he had a recent affair with Claire Claremont, and she was pregnant. So Claire's basically getting banged by everybody. You think they were tag teaming her back in the day? Oh, We're going to find that out later. Now, they arrive at Geneva on the 14th of May, 1816. Um, Mary, at this point, called herself Miss Shelley. So she is officially now Mary Shelley. Uh, Byron joined them with his physician, John Polidori, uh, who also had a crush on Mary. And this guy would go on to take his life by drinking acid in 1821. Like... Acid that just burns your body? Yes. Jesus Christ. <laughs> no, That's no. like a terrible way to go out. I know. This guy was crazy. I thought maybe he just took a shitload of acid tabs. No, acid wasn't invented died. by then. Now, um... Pulled a Nicklaus on us. 25th of May, uh, Lord Byron rented a villa close to Lake Geneva. Percy Shelley rented a smaller building nearby. They spent their time riding, boating on the lake, doing drugs, fucking, and talking into the night. So they would have these crazy drug-induced orgies, apparently. So, obviously... And there's a kid there. The tag team and comes up. Well, I'm sure they left him in the other house or something or other. A little fucking two-year-old kid? No, no, different, different, times, different times, man. Uh, now, <laughs> I here's don't think a, it is different times. <laughs> no one ever said that Shelly won Parent of the Year awards. Now, this particular year that they were out there at this house on the lake in Geneva came to be known as... The year without a summer, um, as the world was locked in a long, cold, volcanic winter caused by the eruption of Mount Tambora, which is in Indonesia, volcano in Indonesia, in 1815. Similar to the year without a Santa Claus. (laughs) Yes, this caused massive amounts. This caused massive amounts of rain in Geneva, and Mary Shelley remembered in 1831. Incessant rain often confined us for days to the house. Well, that probably contributed to all their drug-induced orgies. Well, that's what I'm what getting else at are you here. Supposed to do. So they're sitting around a log fire in Byron's villa. 
Um, and they amuse themselves with German ghost stories, which prompted Byron to propose that they um, see, hey, let's see which one of us can write the best ghost story. Now, a little side note here. Uh, this guy, John Polidori, um, he wrote The Vampire, that's with a Y, in 1819. This came out of this little challenge. This is the guy who drank the acid. Yes. Okay. So, you know, not only do we have Frankenstein out of this challenge, but we also get the, um, you know, modern iteration of the vampire. Vampirism, as some may call it. Yes. This is the OG Twilight. <laughs> Essentially, yeah. yeah. Pretty much, yeah. Because he kind of based it on like these early vampire legends. Yeah, it is actually the tale of Aubrey, a young Englishman, and he meets Lord Ruthven. That's the main protagonist in the story. Now, this is his story? Uh, oddly enough, even though written by Polidori, it was published under the title, quote unquote, A Tale by Lord Byron. Yeah, I think it was like they so kind of collaborated he, on it or something or other. I think that he knew the publisher, and then that guy was like, you got a story you want to publish, bud? Come on, let's hear it. Got Byron on the track. Anyways, this guy... Feet Byron. <laughs> this guy goes off to Rome with Ruthven, who's assumingly the vampire in the story. And, you know, they're just banging people all throughout Southern Europe, pretty much the whole story. He arrives and is killed or so you think by a vampire ends up turning into a vampire himself now he based it off of legends he heard right uh i didn't find much on what he based it on but i did find that this t this tale the vampire would go on to inspire basically everything that we know about vampires from dracula to even twilight now would you say that vlad the impaler yeah, the the OG Dracula, if you will. Now, what did he do? Uh, basically just killed a shitload of people in the 1400s, drank their blood. And he did not say blah, blah, blah. He did like people to call him Dracula, though. Kind of a weird guy. Okay, so we got um, Polidori, Byron. They kind of write the vampire out of this. Now, unable to think of a story, young Mary became anxious. Um, she was asked each morning, hey... You got a story for us for this challenge. And each morning she was forced to reply with the negative. It's kind of like Rob coming up with t-shirt designs. <laughs> yeah. Now, during one mid-June evening, the discussions turned to the nature of the principle of life and galvanism, which is like um, shocking, uh, like a dead frog and it, its muscles twitch, you know? Mm. I don't know. Well, that's what know. I was just telling you. Now, it was after midnight before they went to bed, and unable to sleep, Mary became possessed by her imagination, and she beheld the grim terrors of a waking dream, her ghost story. She describes her dream as, I saw the pale student of an unhallowed arts kneeling beside the thing he had put together. I saw the hideous phantasm of a man stretched out and then on the working of some powerful engine show signs of life and stir with an uneasy and vital motion. Frightful must it be, for supreme frightful would be the effect of any human endeavor to mark the stupendous mechanism of the creator of the world. <laughs> so, uh... <laughs> Your voice cracked at the end there, dude. So she began writing what she assumed would be a short story. Uh, with Percy Shelley's encouragement, she expanded this tale into her first novel, Frankenstein. I think it's pronounced Frankenstein. Or The Modern Prometheus. Uh, published in January of 1818 by a small London publishing house, Lackington, Hughes, Harding, Maver, and Jones... Now, that's a hell of a name right there. It was issued anonymously with a preface written for Mary by Percy and with a dedication to philosopher William Godwin, her father. And it was published in an edition of just 500 copies in three volumes. And um, How much are those bad boys going for? Well, actually, when I was looking it up, <laughs> so apparently 
This was back in like 2013. Some dude just found a copy. Just happened to find one. Yeah, in his grandfather's collection uh, that was inscribed, like it was signed by Shelley to Lord Byron. And he found this edition and it went on, it went up for auction um, starting at 350,000 pounds. So that's like um, like 460 something US dollars, right? Something like that. Probably almost double that. 460,000, yeah. Um, pretty crazy. And so that's the starting amount. They, they didn't release what it actually sold for. But uh, anyways, back to Shelley. So can I say Prometheus? Does that have any uh, tie into our alien episode? I don't remember. That was a long time ago. Well, you remember the legend of Prometheus, right? Giving fire to yeah, people. And kind of, you know, putting Bring the life. humans up on par with the gods because mm-hmm. he gave him fire. So I guess what she was going for there was like Dr. Frankenstein. He's creating life. So he's becoming a god. Right, 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 right. I was just encouraging people to go check out our alien episodes if they have not done so already. Oh, there you go. Nice plug. You like that? Okay. I now, want to raise. On the 31st of October. Halloween. 1831, the first popular edition in one volume appeared. This edition was heavily revised by Mary, uh, partly to make the story, quote unquote, less radical um, this is probably the most widely studied, published, and read version, although a few editions do follow the 1818 version. I want to read that original version now. Well, you got 350,000 pounds, little man? They probably got it translated Well, yeah, they got, they got republished. I'm just saying most editions are going off the 1831 version. Um, and the rest, they say, that's history. <laughs> that was a long pause. Now, as it goes with any monumental accomplishment, um, there's always some fuckery afoot, Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. Um, So aside from the literal fuckery of the orgies that uh, gave Mary the inspiration. Now, um, was it the orgies or the drugs? Or maybe a little bit of both? A little combo, I'm thinking. I'm thinking. Now, aside from... A lot of endorphins going on in that household, I'll tell you that. Yep. And aside from that, Mary and her husband collaborated on the story. But the extent of Percy's contribution to the novel is unknown. Now, it has been argued over readers and critics alike that um, there are differences in the 1818, 1823, and 1831 editions. Uh, Mary claimed that the preface, the preface to the first edition was Percy's work. Uh, however, some argue that Percy's assistance in the book's construction was so extensive that, hey, um, this should probably be seen, like, should this be seen as an editor or possibly a minor collaborator? Uh, Others argue Percy only made minor technical corrections um, and, you know, kind of clarified a few things. And some even say that Percy's contributions to the book were no more than what most publishers or editors have provided or what colleagues provide to each other upon reading... um, a work in progress, you know? Mm. I mean, this is classic uh, sexism, you know? That's what I was saying. Hey, Me too. Chick can't write, can't write a book like this, especially back then. And overall, the book, uh, when the book came out, it was met with uh, a lot of good reviews. And pretty much everybody thought it was good, but there's always a few. Most critics are cynical assholes. Yep. And basically, you know, back to sexism of the time, Um, This is kind of the fault of negative reviews. Now, one review read, The writer of it is, we understand, a female. (laughs) This is an aggravation of that which is the prevailing fault of the novel. But of authorist cannot forget the gentleness of her sex. It is no reason why we should, and we shall therefore dismiss... The novel without further comment. So some of these sexist guys are just saying basically, hey, a a woman writes this? Fuck you. Because the first version was published anonymously, so she did that so that people would read it, you know, unbiased. Because at the time you see, hey, woman? (laughs) Throw it. (laughs) To be fair, these guys probably hated sticks. So she put it out and then she said, hey, guess what, bitches? 
I yeah, wrote that shit. Essentially, yeah. She kind of did a pulled a fucking one two Houdini on him. Oh, think Lord Byron's writing it. Is Boom. It? Guess who's guess who wrote it? The other guy. <laughs> As Rob was just talking about, let's get into some influences other than drugs. So Mary Shelley maintained that she derived the name Frankenstein, or as Adam calls it, Frankenstein. Frankenstein. So Mary Shelley maintained that she derived the name from a dream vision. Uh, Despite her public claims of originality, a number of other sources have been suggested as Shelley's actual inspiration, uh, whether on purpose or subconsciously. And, you know, which I'm thinking, if she was inspired by a dream, then her subconscious definitely came into play. So in 1814, during their return to England from their elopement to Switzerland, Mary and Percy Shelley visited Frankenstein Castle near Dramstadt, Germany. Maybe we should uh, call up your boy Lorenzo, get a translation on this. Now, got a little picture there for you guys. Frankenstein Castle, already looking creepy, right? Love it. So upon seeing this castle, it's almost certain that Mary would have heard the legends of a one Johann Conrad Dippel. And this is just the rundown version. I mean, imagine what that show looked like back in the day. Oh, yeah, probably crazy. Show was probably popping off. Now, this guy, Johann or Johan? Jo- Johann. Johann. Okay, Johann, that's German? Yeah. Johann Mika. Conrad Dippel. <laughs> so he was born in the castle in 1673. He studied theology, philosophy, and alchemy. Uh, He got a master's degree in theology in 1693. And his ideas, I guess, um, or his papers, his studies were controversial at the time. And he was dismissed by one of his most avid supporters as, quote unquote, most vile devil who attempted wicked things. Uh, This guy served a seven-year sentence for heresy Uh, He was banned from Sweden and Russia for controversial theological opinions. And soul transference with cadavers was a common experiment among alchemists at the time and was a theory that Dippel often explored in his writings. And he is rumored to have performed gruesome experiments with cadavers in which he attempted to transfer the soul of one into another. Now, how do you do that? You're going to have to ask this guy. I mean, he's an alchemist. He's fucking around this castle, um, you know, digging up bodies, using them for experiments. This guy was like... Probably didn't even have to dig them up back then. Yeah, this guy was like the day one mad scientist. I mean, um, this guy would also experiment with animals and claims to have discovered the elixir of life and the means to exercise demons through potions he concocted from boiled animal bones and flesh. He has exercised the demons. <laughs> now, uh, now, how many drugs was this guy doing is what I want to know. I mean, 1600s? Probably didn't need that many drugs. <laughs> yeah, just boiling animal bones instead. <laughs> yeah, now, uh, this is the same writing which Dippel claimed that souls could be transferred from one corpse to another by using a funnel oh <laughs> no so, like, i'm no alchemist but i feel like somewhere along the way you kind of learn that those things are a little separate right well i mean think about this guy first off he's an alchemist so he's trying to turn metal into gold okay and his like why he was banned in Sweden and Russia, he was basically writing that, like, the Bible was bullshit. You should not believe in, like, the that the Bible is the word of literal God. And he, well, props to him on that. Yeah, that's why he was in jail for heresy. So I just imagine this guy, you know, he's like, I can turn this metal into gold, and I can put a soul through this funnel. Put it into the other party. <laughs> now, I'm no alchemist, but there's only one thing that could be transferred through a funnel into your body. And that's beer. Thank you. <clears throat> However, I do have a cadaver in my own body. Uh, in your knee? In my knee. A cadaver? You have part of a cadaver. Yeah. A that's cadaver a, is an that's entire That's not a body. soul, though. 
Well, how do you know what part to take out for the soul? That's what I'm wondering. Exactly. What is this guy doing? He's just, he's like fucking H.R. Giger, just fucking, I'm in the shadows oh, hey. transferring souls. <laughs> <laughs> Call me crazy, but I think the soul is separate from the body. So I feel like when your body passes on, your soul kind of remains unless you're like going to heaven or hell if you believe in that. No, Otherwise, Cole, it kind of just hangs which around. This guy didn't, so he probably thought it was like um, still part of your body. Yeah, maybe he th- he was pulling out people's livers, thinking that's the soul. That's what I'm saying. What Imagine if I got him some guy's soul in my knee? Probably not. Well, what if I'm a new soul in this very strange world? What if you got soul, but you're not a soldier? <laughs> we tried. So eventually, Dipple grew into a local folklore. Now I'm going to stop you right there. Is it? Actually, pronounced Dipple. It looks I mean, like Nipple with a D. What would you go German? Dippel? 1600s. Dipel. That's like French. Right? Johann Dipel. Yeah, that's like Italian. <laughs> <laughs> hey, who knows what this? Hey, guy you is. know what? If he's over by what's that Switzerland, they got a whole bunch of French, Italian, German guys collaborating. Yeah, everyone's having orgies, boiling animal who bones. Knows what who knows what's DNA. going on? He's probably got someone else's soul in him now. <laughs> This guy grew into a local folklore, and at least one local minister accused him of grave robbing, experimenting on cadavers, and keeping company with the devil, claiming he had sold his soul to the devil in exchange for secret knowledge. Now, Dipple's reputation became that of a uh, dark sorcerer with knowledge of the Philosopher's Stone and the Elixir of Life. This that sounds a, like some Harry Potter <laughs> shit, dude. <laughs> I'm just going to say Well, that. <laughs> that's probably where Harry Potter got the name from. JK Philosopher's Rowling's Stone was like this legend back in the day. Apparently, if you had this, you could turn any kind of base metal into gold. I don't think that's what Harry Potter's about. <laughs> well, I know. That's what the original tale is. <laughs> <laughs> well, apparently, this guy knows how to do it without that, right? All he needs is a funnel. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, no, no. I, the soul he, transferring he is actually... separate from alchemy. These are two different things. That's his, the soul transferring is like his side gig. I think he was like going more heavily into alchemy. He was just heavily doing beer bongs in his fucking lab. Bomb bag. <laughs> what are you doing here? Oh, just some soul transfers. Get out of here. <laughs> now, all right, guys. So you thought that influence weird. This is where it gets pretty dark. As if the whole fucking story has <laughs> well, been going on. Well, hear me it out. It started out with a girl, a 16-year-old girl being fucked on her mom's grave. <laughs> <laughs> now, here's where it gets really dark, guys. Now, all right, just hear me out. Just hear me out, and you'll you'll see if this is darker. So Probably so. Also... Little disclaimer, all of what follows was taken from translated Polish and German websites. I couldn't find any of this stuff in English except for like two sources. Uh, so bear with me here. This is translated. Can you get Ab to help you out with the Polish? No, sir. And this is another possible influence on the name and at very least a legend that Mary would have heard of. So this translated is the scandal of grave diggers from Frankenstein. So in what is now Poland, uh, but back in the day was Germany, back in the 1600s was Germany, uh, there was the town of Frankenstein. Um, Today it is... Zabkowitz Schlotzky. In lower... Silesia. Now, is that where the castle is? No, this is... the castle still in Germany? It's totally different thing. King of the castle, king of the castle. It's totally different thing. This is just the town of Frankenstein. Um, No relevance. (laughs) Just no relevance to the castle? No, this completely is completely different thing. Yeah, completely different thing. Okay. Different story. Um, so a few books and these Polish German sites uh, report on a paper from 1606. Um, so you know, this is well well, this is uh, well before, Seven years before yeah. yeah, this is before the castle. Um, now in this story, eight grave robbers were arrested, six men, two women. Upon being tortured for their crimes, they admitted to spreading a poisonous powder on the doorknobs, knockers, and thresholds of the houses in this town, poisoning and killing many people. Oh, do you guys remember when this happened in New York City? This, I mean, like... Anthrax? Not anthrax, dude. People were putting, like, rat poison on uh, payphones. Jesus Christ. I don't remember that. Oh, man. My dad, like, sent me email after email about this and was like, this is why you can't use payphones. 
a freaking poison. In New York. And I was hey, like, we put on a freaking rat poison on the phones, okay? He said, never go to Montauk if you know what's good for you. Hey, you want to use the fucking pay phone? You're going to get poisoned, all right? <laughs> no one's using my fucking phones. So these guys were poisoning uh, doorways in this town. Doorknobs, knockers, <laughs> thresholds of the houses. Oh, I bet the they were poisoning thing. knockers. So they killed a bunch of people. Now, were uh, these people actually robbing graves or are they just having an orgy out in the graveyard like Mary Shelley and her friends? Well, why don't you let me finish the story? <laughs> so they then would rob the houses um, and the dead by cutting open pregnant women, removing the babies, uh. and feasting on them, along with the raw hearts of young children. They robbed churches, practiced magic rituals, and had intercourse with dug up bodies. Is it too late to put in a disclaimer? One man claimed to have fucked a virgin in the church upon undertaking, quote-unquote, shocking and outrageous acts. Altogether, 1,500 people were said to have died in the crimes for which these grave diggers were sentenced to death by mutilation and buried alive. Man, can you imagine if that was still happening today? (laughs) Well... I mean, that's a pretty crazy story. This is some cannibal Holocaust shit. And it is often speculated. Now, before, you know, we take that, you got to take this with a grain of salt. Because, I mean, 1606, I mean, how accurate were they at keeping Talk records? Talk about fake news. They probably could have told me who was actually playing running back for the 49ers. Today. <laughs> yeah, it's often speculated that at this time, facts were heavily embellished uh, in order to sell papers. Yeah, you guys ever heard of the Bible? But the <laughs> legend would have still likely been spread and possibly embellished further by the time it got to a young Mary Shelley. It's like a big old game of telephone, but they didn't even have telephones back then. Yeah, probably even worse. Hey, I heard of this guy. He's robbing graves. And then it turns into six it turns guys. Into that, <laughs> eight guys poisoning girls, the whole town. Um, cutting babies. Open babies. Yeah. It's like the satanic panic, yeah. but back in the 1600s. <laughs> that guy. Now, uh, one interesting thing that uh, plays into the whole creature aspect of the novel and another influence, I'd say. So as we discussed earlier, in 1815, uh, Mary had the premature baby, died two weeks later, remember? Mm-hmm. Now, Percy, being the asshole that he was, showed no signs of caring about uh, the premature infant. And remember, he left with her stepsister for an affair? Multiple times. So in the story Frankenstein, uh, when Victor Frankenstein saw the creature come to life, he fled the apartment, um, though the newborn creature approached him as a child would a parent. So the question of Victor's responsibility to the creature is one of the main themes in the book. And this was obviously uninfluenced directly from her experiences, right? Subconscious or not. Mm. Girls love an asshole, am I right, guys? Mm. Yep, and Mary certainly did. Now, <laughs> <laughs> now let's get into the whole misunderstanding of the creature. Uh, you know, Frankenstein, probably one of the like most misquoted, I guess, um, stories in recent times that mm-hmm. I can think of. Because in the book, I mean, it's like you were saying earlier, Rob, Frankenstein is not the monster, although most people think of that. Like, when you think of Frankenstein, you think of the monster. I think of Dr. Frankenstein. Well, you're a true fan. (laughs) And in the book... Or young Frankenstein. The creature, as it is known, is referred to as wretch, monster, creature, demon, devil, fiend, and it. Get back, devil. Um... (laughs) Although the creature would be described in later works as a composite of whole body parts stitched together from cadavers and reanimated by using electricity, this is not the case in Shelley's work. Both the use of electricity and the stitched together image of Frankenstein's monster were more of a result of James Whale's film in 1931, the classic black and white. Now, amongst other early motion picture works based on the creature... Um, In Shelley's original work, Dr. Frankenstein discovers a previously unknown but elemental principle of life. And that insight allows him to um, basically give life to inanimate matter, um, though the exact nature of the process is left up to ambiguity. 
So, you know, you don't really know what it comes from. But in the classic film, we see the electricity, you know, it's alive, the classic line. Um, the creature is given life by Victor Frankenstein. And this addresses the most fundamental of human questions. And as I was saying, we've seen this again and again in topics we cover from aliens to robots to AI. It's the idea of meeting your maker and asking what your purpose is. Why are we here? What can we do? And even further, it's the ethics and morals of the creator, like Jurassic Park. Think of Jurassic Park. Mm. You know, you spend so much time wondering if you could. Never asked if you should. Yeah. It's just like the classic Goldblum line. You know, because in the, in the book, he, he sees the creature and he's like, Jesus Christ, what have I done? You know, he hates the damn thing. I mean, ugly as sin. <laughs> now, who's the real monster there? Exactly. That's what it's getting at. Now, let's get into the film. So there was a few plays here and there uh, in the years leading up to the popularity of film, uh, most of which became very successful. However, the first film adaptation was a silent film in 1910, and there were two more um, silents before we got the instant classic in 1931, Frankenstein. Uh, produced by Universal Pictures, directed by James Whale, starring Boris Karloff as the monster, this is easily what most people think of when Frankenstein is mentioned. Uh, this film had a budget of 262000 uh, made $12 million at the box office, which is a fuckload in today's money, <laughs> and is essentially this and other Universal monster films are what made... Uh, they were all made off the success of Dracula. Because Dracula came out with, um, what's the guy, Bella Lugosi? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they were basically like, holy fuck, we're fucking nothing but horror movies Riding in the queue. this Q. wave. Yep. Yeah. Nothing but horror movies in the queue. Um, and this was also known as pre-code age in the industry. Um, this was before they had ratings, you know, R, P, G. So they kind of get away with whatever the fuck they wanted. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I feel like most of these movies are pretty uh, PG, though. Well, yeah, but you got to think of the standards. time. Yeah. yeah, different times. I mean, we've seen it all today. We got fucking boobs on TV. <sighs> they can say fuck on late night TV now. Late, late night. They can say whatever the fuck they want. <laughs> and, uh, $12 a day. But at, back in the pre-code age, as it's called, this was crazy. They crazy for this one. <laughs> now, uh... It is this version, the 31 version of Frankenstein, that has become arguably the most iconic horror film in history. Mm. I mean, That's a bold statement right there, pal. Yeah. I mean, what are you guys thinking? I'm, I, I would put it right up there with, I mean, now, given all the films that are out, when I think of horror, obviously I think of Halloween. I would say Halloween, Nightmare on Elm Street. So like the 80s, but I mean, 31, man. But I mean, yeah, this is way this before is, our yeah, time. Yeah, way so. before those times. And uh, this was insane for the time. But I mean, just on pure horror, like the thriller aspect of it. Uh, dun, 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 uh. Yeah. <laughs> of what? I'm saying, but I mean, obviously, you know, these movies are made in the fucking 30s, so. Can't really stand the test of time, buddy. Yeah, I mean, I definitely put this in Dracula. I mean, look, think about it. What were the first movies we made when Dad gave us that VHS camera? Titanic. Dra no, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> well, obviously, Titanic's huge Dracula, at the time. Frankenstein. Um, Dracula, Frankenstein. You're making the classic Universal monster. Even Wolfman. We well, always been one? obsessed with monster movies. Yeah. Now, um, you're a monster. <laughs> so after uh, the release of this film. The public at large began speaking of the creature itself as Frankenstein. This also occurs in Frankenstein films, including Bride of Frankenstein um, and several follow-up films, as well as Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. They've even got an Alvin and the Chipmunks meet <laughs> Frankenstein. Um, furthermore, this rendition and future adaptations of the story go on to include an evil lab assistant, Igor. Uh, who is never actually in the original novel. Mm. Now, I mean, what are some other classic Frankenstein films or versions that you guys love? My favorite, Young Frankenstein. Shout out to Gene Wilder, R.I.P. Mel Brooks, right? Yep. Classic, man. 
That I, I think that is the one. I always confuse that one with the original. Understandable. But that's black definitely and white. that's the one with uh, putting on the Ritz, right? Yep. <laughs> Bet oh, your ass yeah. it is. <laughs> that's a great one. You know, I'm honestly surprised that like these movies haven't been like beat to death like all the other remakes you see out there, mm. like Spider Man or Batman. Or, I mean, even, like, horror movies themselves, dude. It's like, I feel like all the time they're like, oh, we got to redo this. Like, you saw it with Nightmare on Elm Street, you saw it with Halloween. Well, I, I guess Universal. And those movies didn't even come out until the 80s, and they've already been remade. But well, I yeah, mean, also man. probably no one wants to uh, touch that, but we'll get to that well, later. Well, could also be the rights. I mean, think sure. about it. If these were some of the first horror movies, I'm sure Universal, like, keeps these rights pretty fucking locked down. What's the last Frankenstein movie you remember? The Jude Law one? Uh, what's that? It's like I Frankenstein? Something like that. Yeah. I, oh, yeah. I was going to see if you saw that. one or some bullshit. <laughs> I mean, like yeah, that. there's classic Son of Frankenstein, Bride of Frankenstein, Frankenstein versus the Mummy, Revenge of Frankenstein, Monster Squad, The Monsters. Ooh, yeah. And I honestly, mean, yeah. Young Frank is probably the only good rendition of it. Um, Yo, Frank and Weenie. Yeah, Frank Monsters. Who's the Monsters the... isn't really, it's Lurch is like an inspiration off of Frankenstein, but I mean. Lurch not... is the butler. In the Adams family. Oh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> 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 well, fuck you guys. Come on, man. Herman Monster. Herman Monster, dude. That's exactly Frankenstein. I and mean, then they're all based off fucking classic the universal monsters. Monsters, but yeah. it's not like a, Shout it doesn't out to really tell that story. Yeah, it doesn't tell the story, but it's still a it's version like of if Frankenstein. The fucking Brady Bunch turned into universal monsters. Dude, I'm sure the monsters were throwing Universal some bills for that content. For Eddie Monster looking like young <laughs> draft. <laughs> now, also, how about this one? Mary Shelley's Frankenstein with De Niro as the creature. Y'all remember that? Mm, yeah, I guess I forgot about that one. It was by, um, what's the fucking gentleman's name? <laughs> You're the movie buff here, buddy. You know, I almost watched that uh, Mary Shelley movie that came out earlier this year. Kenneth Brownell. Oh, yeah, they actually made a movie uh, called Mary Shelley, which is about like basically everything we just said yeah i watched the preview look too fucking depressing oh it's also like a drama not necessarily yeah, a her life, life is a drama buddy we, we just fucking recap i'd say it's it's more of a uh horror gothic horror yeah gothic drama we'll call it i mean that. she's the queen of the goths dude it doesn't who's gonna out goth her <laughs> and i'm sure they're not showing fucking who is it dakota fanning no who is it then oh Ellie Fanning. Yeah. I'm sure they're not showing Ellie Fanning getting banged out on her mom's grave by Percy Shelley. I bet you they mm -hmm. are, dude. All right. We'll see. Yes, we we'll <laughs> see. We'll never go watch the movie. No, but back to Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Kenneth Brownow is the guy that did it. Now. How now, Brown Cow? Do you remember this film at all? The De Niro one? Yep. Vaguely. I remember actually you... We watched it at Grandmom's house. <laughs> yeah, because you rented it from the library. Scared the living piss out of me. <laughs> now, I watched it recently. And this one, it does follow the novel like very closely. But at, just De Niro as the creature... Kind of weird, right? I'm think. Well, when I see De Niro, I'm thinking of Jimmy. Casino. Uh, Jimmy from Goodfellas. Oh, that's all you can really think when you think of De Niro as a mobster. So, you know, he's he's the monster, and I'm just thinking of him in that zone. He got the script. Someone had a typo. It said mobster he was in. And it turned out to <laughs> yeah, be go monster. ahead, sign me up. And then he gets there. Fuck. <laughs> and, I mean, this movie, I, I watched it in preparation for this. I will say. It doesn't have a lot of lines in it. No, I will say it does not really hold up that well, and it's. Yeah, the creature is scary, especially to a young child. It's from like the 80s, though, isn't it? Uh, I believe 90s. But it's like every scene with Victor Frankenstein is like an opera. It's like this, <laughs> there's this <laughs> scene where he's making the creature, and he's running through this giant lab, just like pulling and swinging from these levers in a fucking like gold kimono <laughs> robe. Just hey, running shout out to gold kimono. <laughs> running around. It's fucking weird. Just check it out, you know, if you haven't seen it. That's a good Halloween view. You know, once was enough for me, honestly. No no disrespect to De Niro. Love the guy. Now, nonetheless, today, 
The novel is generally considered mm-hmm. a landmark work of romantic and gothic literature as well as science fiction. Um, contains elements of a gothic novel and the romantic movement, while at the same time, it is an early example, probably the first, of science fiction. Um, Brian Aldiss has argued that it should be considered the first true science fiction story because in contrast to previous stories with fantastical elements resembling those of latter science fiction, the central character makes a deliberate decision and turns to modern experiments in the laboratory to achieve fantastic results. I think that's pronounced laboratory. So, boom. We're seeing science fiction by definition. Science, then fiction. Not fiction, then science. It's called sci-fi in the biz. Yeah. Now, before we sign off on this one, got to leave you with these last few things. And it's going to get dark. Well, I think we've got, we've covered the darkest stuff we're going to (laughs) cover. Although this does arguably get pretty dark. Hello, darkness, my old friend. (laughs) So... Mary Shelley's final years uh, were blighted by illness. Uh, From 1839, she suffered from headaches and bouts of paralysis in parts of her body, which sometimes prevented her from reading and writing. Bouts of paralysis? That's got to be terrible. Yep. (laughs) Just temporarily? Now, on the 1st of February, 1851, at Chester Square, she died at the age of 53 from what her physician suspected was a brain tumor. You know, I honestly feel like that's pretty good for back in the 1800s. Oh, that's hell, that's honest. a hell of a good age. Considering you know? all the shit she wasn't, uh, wasn't like life expectancy back then in like the mid 40s? <sighs> Who knows, but just Google it. Yeah. Now, according to Jane Shelley, Mary Shelley had asked to be buried with her mother and father. But Percy Florence Shelley, who was her only surviving child, uh, Jane was his wife, say the graveyard at St. Pancars was, quote-unquote, dreadful. So they chose to bury her instead at St. Peter's Church, uh, right near their new home in Boscombe. So basically, she wanted to get buried at the spot she lost (laughs) her virginity. Where would that be for you? And they said, basically, fuck you. (laughs) Where would that be for you? Yeah. Well, let's hear yours. No, I asked you guys first. Come on. Well, let's hear it. Well, I guess I'll be buried in Sandbridge then. (laughs) End this on a light note. It's been a dark episode. And I guess I'll be buried in the back of my total to Suzu Rodeo. (laughs) (laughs) And I guess I'll be buried on the futon in your old bedroom. (laughs) Jesus Christ. So, yeah, basically, she wanted to be buried um, with her parents. They said they, her son and his wife said, fuck you. We're just going to bury her close ah, to the it's house. Closer here. Yeah. Ah, that place yeah, is dreadful. That's close to the house. That place fucking sucks. These are your last wishes? No, no, okay. Now, guys. You think she haunted those fucks? <laughs> so, on the first anniversary of Mary Shelley's death, the surviving Shelley's opened her box desk Inside, they found locks of her dead children's hair, a notebook she had shared with Percy, and a copy of his poem, Adonais, with one page folded around a silk parcel containing some of his ashes and the remains of his heart. Oh. Now, he actually had some, like, disease, and his heart had actually turned to bone before he died in a... uh, He drowned in a sailing accident. Um, But his heart... unquote. His heart had turned to bone due to a buildup of calcium and... Drinking too much milk from so, all those titties he was sucking on. Yeah, probably. <laughs> when they cremated him, his heart is the only thing that <laughs> didn't burn. This is some Helga Pataki type of stuff, man. Yeah, she had his fucking bone heart in a silk handkerchief. Now, some say she slept with that under her pillow until her dying day. Ugh. Well, then it wouldn't be locked inside of her fucking desk. Well, it? maybe she did that before she died. I'm about to die. Up. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, there you have it. Um, undisputed queen of the goths. Yeah. Uh, you know, how's that for some Halloween content? Hope you enjoyed it, you fucks. <laughs> no, she takes the cake. You you win. You proved, you proved it. Yeah, I mean, I, 
I don't think anyone's, I mean, pff, I'm sure there's someone out there that's had a darker life than that, but I mean, if not, n- someone, none more famous than Mary Shelley. Someone's yeah. going to hear this episode and go out and try and top that. There's a yeah. new trend on social media. You're welcome. Someone's going to write us an email or slide in the DM. Disclaimer. Say, oh, hey, guess what? Yep. We we don't condone this lifestyle. We don't support the challenges. And yeah, I mean, you know, real quick, um, going back to the whole Universal, like why haven't these movies been beat to death? Apparently, Universal <laughs> Pictures is developing a um, a like reboot of all their modern. They're doing like modern day versions of all the classic monsters, um, and it's going to be called like Dark Universe or something. And there's going to be different films. You know, everyone's biting off the Marvel Cinematic Universe thing, I guess. So it's kind of going to be like that. Um, in 2017, they revealed Frankenstein is one of the films that will have an installment in the Dark Universe. And they had Javier Bardem cast to portray the character. Now, what do we think of that? Um, no Country for Old Men out there. Mm. Playing Frankenstein, that'd be a good one. Um, Pretty but big guy, scary guy. November of that same year, the two guys um, that had signed on to do it had moved on to other projects. So the future is kind of in doubt. I mean, I didn't read too much into this. So if you guys out there know anything about these rumors or um, Universal Pictures rebooting this, um, let us know. Well, I say we steal a book out of old Spielberg's playbook. We just go up to Universal, get ourselves a fucking office, and we just say, hey, guess what, guys? We're here working on Frankenstein. So fuck you. You guys got to start paying us. <laughs> Great idea. We all, look, look, we already got the content. We already got the story. Yep. So show me the money. Help keep us out of the dark when it comes to the dark universe. So, yeah, um, dark universe up in the air. But um, hopefully you enjoyed the episode. Um, let us know. I mean, if there's uh, we're going to continue the theme of October doing uh, creepy type stuff so stay tuned for next week Um, got a good one for you guys and um, if you haven't already be sure to uh, check us out on iTunes uh, 5 Star View and uh, go ahead and smash that uh, subscribe button thank you very much and um, on that guys so long and thanks for all the fish